It is I, the Great One himself. Cynical Libertarian Society. Got some CLSology for you. You can get CLSology on the interwebs anytime you need it. C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com is the website address. I just got up. I was going to get up early this morning and get shit done, but apparently in my world, getting up early means laying in bed until 8.30. I'm on the first cup of coffee. Don't have high expectations for this podcast episode. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Didn't mean to clear my throat in your ear. It still never ceases to amaze me how the microphones, like coughs and sneezes and stuff, just peek out. Everything else is in the normal range. But anyway... Before I talk about what I'm going to talk about, just stumbling around this morning, waking up, I've already had two things I want to mention. Both of them revolve around girls. I love it how when you point out to girls that they are like Schrodinger's cat, they don't exist unless they're being observed. They never believe this. And so I was thinking this morning <clears throat> about a meeting. Actually, it's a series of meetings. There's an organization that I'm in. And everybody in the organization, except for myself, is a woman. And so when we have meetings, it's me and a bunch of women in a room. And I'm getting distracted. And... <laughs> Squirrel! <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. It says me and a bunch of women in a room, which is nowhere near as exciting as it should be because they're not those kind of women. By those kind of women, I mean attractive. In any way. At all. And don't ask why I'm in this organization. Just let it go, okay? Why are you... Just shut. Just shut up. All right. Just let it go for a minute. God damn it, guys. You break once in a while. It was a good idea when it started. <clears throat> I didn't do vocal warm-ups either, as you can tell. And so, every time we're in a meeting with these people, every time I'm in a meeting, me and the voices in my head, I'm in a meeting with all these women, and the meeting, like 50% of it, is them talking about their kids. And this one girl talking about her titties, how she took a picture of her titties, and it was on Facebook, and oh, her titties look so good, but she was really upset because her stomach was also in the picture, and her stomach was hanging over, but her titties sure did look really good. I was like, fucking Christ, can we talk about the subject matter at hand? Do, does ev As women, like, does everything constantly have to come back around to you? Your titties, your children, you, 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 you. And of course the answer is yes, yes it does. Because women are like Schrodinger's cat. If they're not being observed, if somebody's not paying attention to them, they don't exist. My second thought about women that I had, and now I'm going to get to talking about this at some point in the future. <laughs> Boy, you've heard that before. Uh, it's in the pile over there. There's, there's a giant pile of stuff that I need to take to the studio and I need to review and that I need to record in stating the obvious with the lovely and adorable Randy. Uh, in a, the latest issue of College Avenue Magazine, which is the magazine for Colorado State University, it used to come out in a magazine format, and they've cut their budget or something, and now it comes out as a cheap newspaper format. Anyway, there's an article in there about BDSM, Fifty Shades of BDSM. And then, of course, the Fifty Shades of Grey movie is coming. And what we see in our society from the behavior of women from their response to this type of material. You know, as I've said before, what women want more than anything, as Matt Forney said, 
is women have a hole inside of them. And if their hole does not have either a penis or a baby inside of it, they're incomplete. That was his way of putting it, and I've come to agree with that. Right, A woman without a purpose in her life, either the purpose of the child or the purpose of serving the man, is an incomplete woman. And women go through life looking for resources and looking for a man to dominate them because that's what makes their life complete, right? Is having resources to provide for their children and for their own, their, their you know, excessive spending. Aaron Clary did a great video about this, about how much money women spend and how we can eliminate the entire national debt in, what was he calculated, some 10 years or less. Like if all the money women spent on bullshit was just used to pay off the national debt, we could pay it off in no time. I mean, no time geologically speaking, of course. But women go through life looking for resources and looking for a man to dominate them. And so the type of men women are looking for are the kind of men who go out and make a lot of money and then have you know sex and butt fuck them and spank them and all this other stuff. At the very same time, in the same issue of College Avenue Magazine, there's an article in there about how terrible men are and about how men need to be less masculine and how the, that shooter kid who is the feminist shooter, how he was because of masculinity. I forget his name. Who gives a fuck? We'll talk about it then. But the point I'm getting at is that at the same time, young boys right now, college-age men, and not certainly not all of them, but many of them, are just being pussified by the system. I mean, yes, there are still some men who are escaping the pussification system and being quote-unquote real men, but most of the men are being taught to be feminist. They're being taught to ask girls for permission and to be all submissive and don't look at girls because they'll get raped and all this other stuff. Oh shit, it's Sunday, isn't it? Fuck, I gotta go do that. Okay. See, now I am getting distracted. Hang on a second. I gotta do this. Hey, what the fuck is this? Alright. Well, too much for my computer skills. Alright. <clears throat> I'm back. So you got college teaching boys to be pussies, while at the same time, what women really want is to be dominated. They're just setting themselves up for failure. And none of this is going to end well. And speaking of things that don't end well, this is not ending well. Fuck. Alright. And... Yes, I have to stop getting distracted. Hold on a second. Yes, that was number two. Now, here's what I was going to talk about today. Markets. Can the market solve problems? Of course, as anarcho-capitalists, we believe the market can solve problems, right? Of course we can. Of course we do. Something occurred to me the other day. As Randy and I were upgrading the computer system at the studio, which is why there was no podcast on Friday. We're putting in these new monitors that are 180 resolution, 180 pixels, 1,000, 180. <laughs> 1,080 pixels you know, on the tall side, right? And as we're doing this, I'm going, you know, the old, these crappy old CRTs we have have a higher resolution because they're because our, our I, these CRTs they were doing sixteen hundred by twelve hundred. I'm like, why did I just spend? Because I had to spend money because you people didn't send me any Bitcoin because you're selfish and you hate children. 
why did I spend money buying a computer monitor that's 300 fucking dollars and has a lower resolution than the monitor I already have? Isn't the market supposed to be making things better? Yet, the market gives people what they want. So obviously, a lower resolution monitor is what a majority of people want. Now, I was thinking about this. I was trying to think, why is it the market is giving me a monitor that does 1080 and costs $300 to replace a monitor that I've owned for years and works great and does 1200 Why is it the market is giving me something that costs a bunch of money that gives me less performance than what I already have? Because if, as anarcho-capitalist, we're going to argue that the market will always eventually come to the best outcome. Now, you can throw in stuff, well, the best outcome takes time, and other things, so I get that. But generally speaking, again, we're, we're speaking, I'm just speaking generally here, guys. As anarcho-capitalist, we would say that the market is eventually going to bring about the best solution to a problem, right? But then something occurred to me. Because um, the market, right, market forces, market is driven by what people want, right? The market is essentially, if you're an ANCAP, you already know this, the market is a reflection of what people want. It's a reflection of what people are willing to spend their money on, which means what people are willing to invest their time in, right? Because as Aaron Clary wrote in his fantastic fucking book that if you don't own it, you should go buy it, you should fucking read this book. His book, Bachelor Pad Economics. I couldn't remember the title for a minute there. Right, time is, I mean, excuse me, money, <laughs> one cup of coffee, this is what you get. Money is time. Money is stored up time. So when you spend money on something, you're spending your time on it. You're saying it's important to you because, um, again, if you're a welfare recipient, if you're a parasite, that's different. This is only for those of you who actually work for a living. The, the market is a reflection of what people want. And as I'm looking at this monitor with its lower resolution, something occurred to me. And that thing that occurred to me is that because the market is a reflection of what people actually want, of what they're willing to invest their time and money in, this is a, this is a wonderful, great thing. This is why the market is powerful. This is why it's more powerful than government, why it's more powerful than anything. And then it occurred to me, what if you live in a society where 99% of the people are complete fucking morons? And the market is a reflection of what the people want. As I've been arguing for a while here on this podcast, the market will work, but only if we stop circumventing natural selection. 